great. So I can think, I think we can start by saying thank you. Um, thank you all. Uh, this is a part of uh, a small a mini series that us um, volume magazine thought of um, in the context of the overarching question of the biennial which is what do we have in common um, we've seen it in previous events being inflected um, often in terms of commons other times in terms of participation other times uh, in different directions and we particularly focused in this case, in this micro series, um, in two aspects of participation. Um, one that we talked about yesterday with uh, Jakob van Rijs, the co-founder of uh, MVRDB, and in that case we really framed it around negotiations and designing negotiations at completely different scales. We saw in some cases uh, in the scale of the building, in some other cases, all the way to, to urban planning. Um, understanding that individuality is by now an aspect that we have to take into account um, and individual ambitions as well. Today, today we have invited instead um, a completely different uh, point of view, I would say, but curiously that might uh, find uh, common points also with what was said yesterday. So without saying too much, I always talk too much, so I'll pass uh, the word to Denise for the introduction. Thank you, Farah. Um, well, welcome everybody that is joining us um, ghostly online. Um, my name is Denise Vega de Santiago. I'm also part of the uh, research and editorial team at Volume Magazine. And I'm um, yeah, I'm personally very happy to be moderating this uh, second talk as part of the, 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 the biennial um, in which we have like this um, amazing guest, Jose Sanchez. I will just uh, give a brief introduction of him. Jose Sanchez is an architect, game designer and theorist based in Detroit. He's director of the Pletora Project, a research studio investigating the future of propagation of architectural design knowledge. He's the creator of the video games Blue Hood and the Uncommon Hood, which act as digital, digital social platforms that aid the authoring of architecture and ecological thinking to non-expert audiences. Um, today, in the context of, of, of the biennial and the context of the commons, we I think he, he has a lot of things to say about this since um, his latest uh, book, it's uh, Architecture for the Commons, Participatory Systems in the Age of platforms. Uh, this research designs and interrogates social media platforms as tools with the potential to author architectural content in the public domain. Jose has taught in renewed institutions uh, such as the ANA in London, the Bartlett School also in, in, in London, and the University of Southern California, and currently teaching at the University of Michigan. Um, so yeah, we are really happy to have him. Uh, also, in the context of volume, last year we published the issue Playboard, in which we were really kind of uh, uh, trying to address and make a sort of a critique of the notion of gamification in its relation, of course, to, to labor and to exploitative practices of contemporary capitalism, but also trying to address it from an architectural perspective, how these neoliberal conditions of work uh, are also permeating the architecture field. Uh, but at the same time, how new modes of resistance, in a way, or new modes of uh, alternative practices or alternative modes of participation can, can also emerge from these new platforms and technologies. So, um, yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, to hear what Jose has to say. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Jose, for being here. Thank you, Denise, and thank you, Francesco, and, and thanks again for the invitation of the biennial to, to be able to kind of participate and, and engage in the dialogue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but I think that that needs to be enabled by Francesco. Is that, could you make sure that we can share our screen as well? 
There we go. So can you see my screen? Is that good? Great. Um, so yes, uh, the event, we, we framed the event uh, in conversation with Denise and Francesco to, to discuss ideas of participation in the age of platforms, which is a subtitle um, of the book, The Architecture for the Commons, Participatory Systems in the Age of Platforms, which I just published with Routledge. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is uh, briefly touch upon some of the ideas of the book uh, for those who I maybe haven't really had the chance to, to check it out. But at the same time, uh, something that I don't do in the book is really connect uh, those ideas necessarily to the work so tightly um, that that's been done purposely, uh, assuming that in a way sometimes ideas can go much faster than projects. And in a way, the book really becomes a, a kind of a, a vector or direction where, where the work wants to go. So I want to also share some of the projects and, and the kind of mentality behind the design work, um, the design of video games and platforms for architecture, um, and how it, there's kind of a, a dialogue between the book and the work. Um, and I want to really start with uh, intimating a little bit. Um, I'm a Chilean architect that has recently moved to Detroit, and I've been overwhelmed by kind of being able to see some of the work of Diego Rivera here in Detroit, uh, in the Detroit Institute of Arts, and understanding the kind of the context in which that work emerged. Right? When we talk about social realism, um, as in the case of Rivera and some of other Mexican muralists like Siqueiros or Orozco, um, we seem to see that there's a turn of representation, a turn towards uh, portraying uh, figures, human bodies in a way that are kind of a, in, the, in the receiving end of certain oppression. Um, and I think that uh, some of the ideas uh, that the syndicate of technical workers, painters and sculptors back in the day, uh, uh, back in the twenties, uh, really resonates with me today. It's some of the ideas of kind of a form of repudiation for a form of ultra intellectual art um, and really thinking of art more as in the public domain. Um, um, how art was not longer seen as an expression of individual satisfaction, but rather a fighting and educative form of art, right? Like, um, I think that some of those ideas uh, could be revisited in the context of Black Lives Matter today. Um, and obviously some of the kind of economic impact, the inequality that we're seeing and, and how that is being kind of exercise in the form of evictions and, and, and many other uh, conditions. Uh, in my own Chilean context, uh, we are going through kind of an important Chile, uh, like social transformation. Um, there has been recently um, a, a vote for the, the change of a historic constitution that was uh, drafted in the 1980s by the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. And by an overwhelming majority, there is a need for changing um, what many have talked about, uh, kind of the foundations of neoliberalism that were instantiated at that time. Um, Naomi Klein and many others have written about how the ties of Chile kind of really became a testbed or an experimental testbed for neoliberal practices. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of very excited to be part of a country that it's, started, it's been going through a process of rethinking what a constitution really needs. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of the motivations or uh, the background of, of, of where I come from. Um, and in the book, I really kind of started doing an analysis of uh, supply chains in a way. Um, and specifically, I talk about the idea of vertical monopolies or vertical integration. Um, for those who you uh, maybe that might not know the term, a vertical uh, integration is the idea that you would kind of uh, own a whole production uh, supply chain uh, along a vertical, meaning like from the retailer to the producer. Um, horizontal integration is often a band, it's actually illegal uh, as a form of monopolistic practice, but vertical integration is certainly um, practice and it's seen in many ways as a form of optimization. Um, in a way, the, the model that is being left behind is a, it's the inefficiency of parts as produced by a multiplicity of actors in the economy. And the idea of vertical integration has been portrayed by someone like Elon Musk with the uh, SpaceX or Tesla factories. Um, talk about uh, the reduction of members in the economy or uh, internalizing the production of elements, therefore reducing the number of components, reducing the cost and optimizing the, uh, the production and the supply chain. Um, this is very much the case in examples like the Eon engine by Relativity Space, um, who um, do a 3D printing process for kind of 3D printing this kind of engine. And they really kind of advertise in their website how uh, it's very important for them to, the 3D printing process allows to reduce the number of components 
so in a way, uh, there's kind of a sense of coalescence of parts and, and in a way cutting the idea of disruption as used in Silicon Valley is literally a description of how we can actually slice and optimize a supply chain, right? Other forms of proprietary uh, kind of uh, enclosures uh, are seen in, for instance, the iPhone, where you kind of, you look at your iPhone and you might be able to see the pentalobe screw, which is a proprietary screw that would keep people out of repairing it. The right to repair, which is a movement uh, for allowing uh, members, anybody to really kind of open up uh, a device and be able to repair it or alter it. It's something that has been uh, discussed. And uh, I find that quite interesting how it really kind of comes to the politics of parts. Uh, and in a way, um, Corporations today seem to be creating these closed ecosystems where parts can actually coexist within that system, both software and hardware, but they are kind of alienated from a general public. So this, this really takes us to what, what seems to be happening at a larger scale. So what, what, hap what happens in, in, in the economy, it certainly kind of resonates with uh, the practice of architecture that has been uh, looking at uh, technologies like 3D printing, um, in a, in a form of disruptive forms of production uh, that really kind of uh, also dissolves parts, right? It also kind of creates this kind of coalescence of parts when we see the differentiation of materials in the case of 3D printing by, you know, people like Raglin, Ari Oxman, Zaha Hadid. There's this notion of the dissolution of tectonics, right? Um, we don't longer need parts. Parts could actually be think as a fluid gradient condition. Um, and it seems to me that for a long time, the idea of a vertical factory you know, or a vertical, vertically integrated practice of architecture, especially for housing, has been a long standing dream. The case of Walter Gropius and uh, Konrad Baxman talk about the, the production and actually had the design plan for the General Panel Corporation, the design of factories that would actually be able to deliver the full extent of, of a house uh, or, a, or a basically a housing system. Um, at the same time, while that dream is kept alive by companies like Katera today, really dreaming, trying to um, vertically integrate the housing industry. And this is seen with great hope uh, in, this, in the sense of like uh, optimization that it can bring and the reduction of cost. But I do see that there's a kind of a, a great social impact and a social challenge to be able to do so um, in the sense of uh, reducing the number of agents and the, the number of uh, entities that would participate in the economy. Um, so we are kind of concentrating wealth and we're actually reducing the diversity of uh, a market. So I would actually, I, I make a case in the book that you know, is kind of central um, to the argument, which is a defense for parts, right? And because parts really, for me, socially enable uh, participation and kind of contributions that could come from different places, right? In this case, I, I want to show uh, one project that, that happened many years ago, but it certainly kind of was the, the first steps in my, my research of going into understanding how parts could be, in this case, uh, serialized, right? Like in the project uh, Bloom, uh, I was thinking of a singular entity, a singular unit that could be organized in many different ways, but really opening up that unit very much like a toy uh, to a public, uh, to, a, to an audience, right? There were no blueprints. People were not asked to build a particular kind of blueprint of the design, but rather they were invited to kind of create uh, structures that would have their own kind of value systems uh, and, and conting contingent forms of uh, meaning. Uh, similarly, recent projects that kind of engage with discrete forms of architecture also thinks of parts as kind of the minimal intervention that could be already uh, established with, a, with an already kind of existing standardized set of parts as you can find, you know, with timber, you know, standardized timber. In this case, the, the Combo Nest project, it's a, it's a joint that kind of redirects the orientation of timber to create larger structures. So it's really trying to position design as how do we kind of create a larger set of units that could uh, further allow the recombination of the parts that we already have available. Um, and when we think about projects like this one, we really also think about them as in the form of games uh, or toys that might have certain uh, information and, and kind of knowledge uh, uh, learning structures, but at the same time are quite open-ended in their kind of possibility to be designed. And the idea of transitioning to think of video games in my work, um, it's really, as a, as a mechanism for allowing a much kind of larger and global, uh, you know, 
recombination of parts as a, as a participatory strategy in architecture, right? So they're kind of very linked. The idea of discrete architecture and kind of the reconsideration of parts is highly uh, linked to the idea of enabling kind of social platforms uh, that are kind of publicly accessible. Um, so in a way, I try to kind of create a contrast between a tradition of digital architecture that has uh, been for a long time trying to optimize a singular entity, um, like in the case of Gaudi of Rayoto, the tradition of, of form finding and optimization as a, as a unit of architecture that optimizes itself inwards. And how do we think of perhaps discrete architecture and, and a kind of a re-exacerbation of parts as a, as a kind of optimization of the collective? It's like how parts can create a kind of a form of a combinatorial surplus, as I describe it in the book, right? How parts can actually have value beyond the particular building in which they are instantiated, but it can actually migrate and perhaps find meaning in other kind of projects, right? So at a central stage, discrete architecture is a project of coordination um, and digital platforms will play an important role there. So the problem is that platforms are very problematic space, I would say today. And I, I definitely have been kind of theorizing and kind of participating on a conversation about uh, the ethical challenges that we see on platforms, right? When we talk about platforms, we're talking about places where we hang out, like Facebook, YouTube, you know, Instagram, and many others. And people like Shoshana Zuboff have really argued for the extractive uh, power of platforms, right? There is a form of surveillance capitalism or platform capitalism, as Chernichek would argue for it, um, that a uh, that has an incredible coercive power and kind of undermines democracy as we've seen in the case of Cambridge Analytica um, and you know, through the, the whistleblower Christopher Wiley who had really kind of opened the door and, and you know, started corroborating some of the information and the power that, that platforms seem to have. And, and that seems to be a, a highly problematic uh, condition of platforms. Um, one that we should perhaps not shy away from, and, and really, I, and here is where I kind of try to, in the book, and, and, and uh, I want to kind of find ingredients or elements that seem to kind of offer um, perspectives in which we could engage digitally, but do so in a way in which we, we get a uh, right to privacy and forms of protection for uh, the people participating in such platforms, right? Um, so Julian Assange uh, talks about the idea of uh, cryptography and how cryptography is kind of a, the ultimate form of nonviolent action where kind of a strong cryptography would really allow for, um, it, it cannot be coerced into, uh, into submission in a way. Um, we seem to see a lot the idea of anonymous authorship in platforms where kind of the, the provenance or the, the origin of content or producers and labor uh, seems to be forgotten. Um, and, and someone like Ted Nelson, that has been argued by, by General Lanier, uh, has envisioned a form of platform where there is kind of tracking of provenance, right? Like how do we kind of go back to the contribution of value in, in the case of users and the public? So there, there are ways in which we could actually think of platforms in a, in a less coercive or non-coercive at all, in a, in a way in which we could actually validate the, the participation and, and labor from users. Um, an important part of, for the work that I discussed before in terms of combinatorial design uh, is the idea of share-alike, right? Like in, in the Creative Commons uh, license, you can see this kind of share-alike attribution, which is the right to remixing and transforming the content. So assuming that every piece of content is always sitting on the shoulders of prior content, uh, there, there needs to be perhaps uh, a continuation of this notion of remixing. And finally, uh, how platforms could be thought as cooperatives, right? Uh, in the case of like the, this, the work of Trevor Schultz, this is heavily documented and, and I find it a, a really interesting uh, twist to the notion of platform as a, as a platform that is able to um, compete with contemporary centralized platforms and offer workers the, the possibility to own their own uh, spaces, man. Right? So the challenges, uh, as, as we can summarize them, the user exploitation, inequitable value production, um, value in the hands of platform owners, not users, the asymmetry of power, and the possible responses to some of those as has been found with uh, the, the use of strong encryption, provenance tracking, uh, cooperative structures, and, uh, you know, uh, forms of share-alike. 
in architecture, I don't think we do have a, a strong kind of culture of platforms. Or so, in, in a way, I feel like we we are called to be thinking and creatively designing what should our platforms be. We have things like three D warehouse uh, or Instagram, which in many ways uh, feel insufficient to kind of think of architecture and, and share architecture in any kind of meaningful way. Um, and there's projects that have a very strong sense of tectonics uh, and understanding of how open source architecture at the tectonic level could be uh, thought as a distributed kind of participatory practice as well, which I, I, I kind of uh, celebrate. And I think that, um, but those are using things like GitHub or other kind of uh, protocols of, of, of uh, coordination, not really kind of engaging uh, a much more uh, open uh, audience to, to engage with these platforms, right? You do need a, a level of expertise to engage uh, with these platforms. And I think that in the, the, the world of games really offers, um, op offers like what I call a kind of a literacy ladder, the opportunity that you could actually go from complete non-expert, not, not having the knowledge required, but perhaps slowly kind of go through and educating yourself and participating on sharing and uh, altering perhaps someone else's content and eventually authoring your own content. Uh, this is an example from The Sims. And, and this is a research that I've been doing since 2013. Uh, I started this in the Bartlett um, uh, with, the, with the studio Gamescapes. And this is a work from students uh, from the time. Um, and it has really kind of evolved over years to kind of starting to, to author my own uh, take on what a video game for architecture should be. Um, so I want to show briefly two projects that maybe uh, you have seen before, but uh, there's definitely kind of uh, important for me to contextualize them in the, in the sense of how do we kind of allow a, a mechanism, in this case, a, a digital um, simulation to allow the recombination of parts. So the game Blockhood is the idea of discretizing the city um, or thinking of the city as a series of blocks that share different relationships with one another and the, um, the player is invited to combine and, and reorganize those um, blocks in, their, in different ways. Um, the idea of the, this block kind of floating, as a floating island in the sky, uh, talks about the, the reduction of externalities, meaning that you have to take care of your own waste, you have to take care of your own energy production and food production. So it's trying to envision a kind of a diagrammatic chunk of the city that uh, cannot you know, uh, practice a form of externality uh, as kind of sending the waste of, of a particular neighborhood uh, somewhere else. So how would it be to consider uh, all the kind of in ecological interdependencies of a, of a block from within the space? And in a way, the player, it's not really uh, asked to do anything. I mean, the player, in a way, creates its own problems. If you want to create a kind of a, a habitat for, for you know, uh, different species, that's up to the player to really define what are the, uh, the kind of the, um, the ingredients, what are the blocks that would enable or create the affordances for such inhabitation. Right. So you can see some of more of the, the videos uh, on the content online. The game, it's been uh, available for quite some time. Uh, it has a free educational license and, and it's also been provided through main entertainment video game networks. Um, the game wants to offer a different kind of supply chain models where you can actually simulate in a kind of a very diagrammatic form. What would it be like to, uh, to work with an organic food or, or kind of industrial food production system or an organic as an example, right? And in many cases, there's always that kind of decision where the player understands what are the kind of uh, implications and drawbacks from taking any of these decisions. And the game really doesn't offer you a optimal solution. There is no right solution for the game. There's always patterns, very much in the tradition of Christopher Alexander, but really not really thinking that there are uh, absolute patterns that are correct, but perhaps patterns that are local and idiosyncratic to the communities you know, producing them. Um, and this is kind of a, something that is recurrent in my work to really kind of think of a form of value production that is very local and it's centered around the player or the kind of the communities producing it. Um, I, I do not impose a value system within the games and, and, and software that I developed in a way. Um, the games try to kind of be a form of literacy production um, and knowledge propagation as create a, as a open a conversation and perhaps uh, could allow for the kind of the, the production of consent or a, a conversations about different perspectives. 
And these are kind of examples of how we're kind of taking the game into the classroom or into the streets to kind of, uh, but also obviously uh, being played by thousands of players online. And finally, uh, to close, uh, this is kind of material of my recent video game. I'm still working on, on this with a, with a large and, uh, team that I want to thank for, for working with me on this, uh, the game Common Hood. And it, the game Common Hood really takes a turn towards uh, this form of kind of social realism that I was talking initially, where uh, we kind of position ourselves within some of the social struggles that we see in the economy, from evictions uh, to the occupation of abandoned places in the seek of shelter and how does architecture and self-provision kind of emerge out of a, a form of precarity. Um, it really kind of tries to think architecture from a perspective of scarcity and, and what is the ecology of labor in a way from a, the access to materials, the access to tools, the access to knowledge, the access to labor. Uh, the game doesn't really allow you to just model architecture as we would normally do in, in any kind of software platform where you have an infinite abundance set of primitives and lines, but rather it kind of constrains your, your possibility to grow and create something by uh, the immediacy of resources and the scarcity of resources that you have around you. So the player is invited to create different forms of production. Um, you could take a path towards farming uh, or you know, brewing beer or creating uh, carpentry or you know, metalworking. Um, and it really kind of allows the players to share uh, different forms of designs, mostly architectural designs that have to do with the production of shelter and architecture from within this condition, right? This is a model as players kind of uh, start developing a, a design and they could actually share that and it would actually give you not only a list of uh, elements that were considered within the design, but it would allow others to be able to download uh, the pieces and, and the designs that come from it having a ledger of who has participated on, on the production of such content, right? So it's really kind of trying to create this form of, a, you know, open source online commons for a, the, the sharing of architectural ideas. Um, what the game is really trying to store is not the geometry, because we don't think that the geometry has enough information to, to be a form of transferring of knowledge, but we actually store the actions of a player in space that is owned by the player, and that player might decide to share or not to share um, uh, that content with other players. And, and it really shows a kind of a, a timeline of how a player is almost thinking in the design process, perhaps going back and forth between uh, a design and ultimately being able to share that kind of blueprint, which is a sequence of actions on space. Um, the simulation of labor, uh, you, you, you cannot really download a blueprint and just stamp it into the world. It needs to be built again from scratch if you have the right materials and the right kind of machinery to actually execute that. So there's kind of uh, this idea of copy paste, which seems to kind of come from a, a notion of infinite abundance. It doesn't really exist within the game. Uh, and it creates uh, a sense of understanding that certain designs are more valuable because they could be reproduced in different ways. Um, we, we, we definitely want to kind of talk about automation within the game, but it's certainly a conversation about the challenges and the impact of automation. The, the player has to kind of go through the decision of how to grow a community, how to kind of, you know, uh, create a, a form of wealth within the community. And that uh, when, when the opportunity of introducing machinery like that can automate systems is offered, it's always in the contrast of how does it perhaps replace or collaborate with uh, other kind of workers. Um, so I wanna uh, share this uh, video, which is kind of the state of the game. The game is gonna be released next year, but it's, it's kind of something that we're kind of testing and still kind of developing uh, actively. Um, many of the ideas that are presented in the book are kind of actively being, a, you know, prototyped in the game. How do we create uh, forms of protection of, of, you know, encryption and protection of the content of users? How do we avoid the extraction of the content produced uh, by any kind of external interest? And how do we maintain a form of value production that remains in the hands uh, of players? The game wants to really open up a, a whole different series of uh, trajectories for fabrication and, and production in, in terms of uh, food production and, and the idea of, of food commons and food networks but also um, how do we kind of create self-sustaining uh, environment? Uh, and the looming kind of narrative that the, the game really kind of portrays is, is always 
within the challenge of, of this kind of eviction process, the kind of the, the occupation or the kind of carving out of uh, forms of ownership and property that um, seem to be or are necessary to be recovered from a state that has uh, pushed so many people into a form of, of precarity, right? So um, just looking ahead and to finish with this final slide, I, I, the game really wants to kind of argue for design uh, mediated by scarcity. Labor is not an externality. Uh, incentivize the construction of online commons and, and open a conversation around that. Uh, making architectural knowledge accessible and shareable. Track provenance so that you know, players' contributions are not you know, exploited or kind of extracted as a form of, uh, as, it, as it happens with AI, for instance, uh, the extraction of value from uh, or illegitimate extraction of value from users uh, and a fair recognition and remuneration of value uh, creation. The, Donna Haraway talks about the idea of sympoiesis, which is a word that for me resonates strongly, especially when we have architects discussing the notion of autopoiesis like Patrick Schumacher and so on. And I would like to replace that notion with a form of sympoiesis, which as she describes is a simple word. word. Uh, it, makes, it means making with nothing make itself and uh, nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. Uh, so with that, I will thank you and I leave it there so that we could open up a conversation. Thank you so much, Jose. I was really, um, yeah, yeah. I think every time that you see some kind of video game or something, it's just, uh, yeah, just super nice. Um, well, maybe I can, yeah, we can just start uh, the Q&A before we have some questions from the audience. Um, I think from, from my point, I, I don't know, like <laughs> you touch upon so many like uh, important things around questions around like the profession and around labor and about also video games and platforms specifically. Um, I think I had a question prepared, but now that you saw, you, you put the five like last points of like incentivizing online commons or like struct, not extracting or exploding uh, uh, knowledge from the user, but really like working with, like all of that makes so much sense, but it's, it's insane to think how that is very still far away from the reality of architectural profession, right? Like okay. at school and also in terms of, uh, you know, this unpaid labor, unpaid internships, uh, the culture of um, architecture competitions, it is all this excess of production. So it's, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult, no, to, to sort of, I think you are doing like a great work in terms of really trying to challenge that. But I, yeah, I don't know, it's still, I don't know, I feel a bit, um, yeah, it's a bit strange that it is still so far away from, from the profession, no? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, I don't think that many people in the professions, I think, would, would agree that there is a kind of um, an interest to, to resist some forms of exploitation. I don't think that anybody likes working for free uh, or having free internships, which seems to be, in many cases, common practice. And, and when it happens that we seem to kind of, as it happened with the Serpentine, a pavilion in London um, that started kind of pointing out practices that are exercising this kind of tradition of free internships and slowly starts kind of rippling into stopping other forms of free internships. I, I kind of celebrate that. So there seems to be an interest to kind of create a more equitable practice of architecture from within. It's not just about the narratives that the, ar the architecture can do, but also how, um, how do we exercise uh, and how do we exercise as soon as we kind of come out of school um, in many cases, in a way, school already uh, seems to be portraying um, a practice of like not really managing time sometimes so well or kind of uh, requiring students to kind of do far more than when sometimes they're able to do. Um, so I think that that conversation is, is very active and a lot of people would stand in the same place. Um, but once you start moving towards practice and, and something like block code, which is a, it's a game that, you know, had... Uh, over a hundred thousand players, um, people start kind of approaching it, and, and I, I got kind of invitations to kind of start thinking about how the game could be used as a form of competition entry. Right? How can we make a call for people to design things, and we would, you know, end up with a database of designs, and it, and instantly start seeing how people start 
trying to assume that this could be a form of value extraction. And, and I think that someone like Trevor Schultz have been leading the way on discussing, and, and many others, of course, in, in, yeah. in kind of discussing labor, uh, how these exploitative practices should be resisted, right? And I think that they could be resisted, or they should be also resisted from the design of the platforms themselves. There should be kind of forms, uh, we should, I, I don't think that we should shy away from a, uh, engaging with a form of global digital platforms, but really kind of participate on the discussion of, okay, if we're gonna try to create a form of global cooperation, right? What are the protocols that need to be in place? And in many cases, I, I can share with you my own shortcomings for this. Um, this has highly kind of technical requirements or legal requirements to be kind of gone through. Um, and we architects are not equipped for that. It's a process that in our case has been taking time and it's also hoping that the, our own conviction can actually maintain these platforms free from external interference. But the last thing that I would like to see is, is actually that uh, this becomes a new form of 21st century competition when you could have thousands of players or even kids as you might uh, discuss in the, in the playbook issue, right? Um, playing and then that becoming kind of, let's say, the value extraction for um, artificial intelligence, a machine learning algorithm that would ultimately learn how to do architecture, you know, automate architecture with this illegitimate extraction of, of, of knowledge. So, so that needs to be resisted, I would say, and, and protected through the design of, of these enterprises. I think, I mean, if, even if, 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 yeah, if we talk about this, like from the design from the architecture as platform or the design of, 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 of the software or earlier that like you were talking about, like, uh, yeah, more platform in the more like in, in the digital sense of like Facebook or social media. Uh, I think like a key word here is, is the notion of participation, right? And like this almost like cultural understanding that Facebook is like a democratic tool, right? Or Instagram or like because it allows participation because it's a... Uh, you create your own content, whereas it's, yeah, as, as we know by now, it's not really true. And it's like just a different way of like an extractive and exploitative digital platform. So I think even if, you know, architecture is also becoming more this kind of like resource or source, it, it it's not really much, I think about participation, but like what kind of participation that entails. And also, I guess the question of ownership, right? Or like common, ownership because it's exactly as you said right now like yeah what if uh, in the future there will be way more participatory architecture platforms in which you design but if in the end it becomes like a different bar yeah a different option for architecture competitions then nothing would really change it would just be like a more fancy uh, a more fancy technology but the, the the collectivization of that or the common ownership of that is what it seems to me like uh, one of the biggest challenges or one of the biggest acts of resistance that could be through digital platforms. Uh, right. Yeah. So I agree. I think that there's there's certain other challenges as well, um, as you're pointing out. For instance, the the production of the platform itself should be collected. I mean, this is one of the moments in which I also reflect upon how, what is the kind of the software architecture of this platform so that they could remain open-ended. In, in gaming, you have a, a strong culture of modding, which is like, you know, players being able to alter the software, contribute to the software, um, and also extract ultimately their own production from the software. So in a way, seeing yourself not as a platform provider, but rather kind of one entity that coexists within already kind of a, a kind of a, a series of other kind of platform producers. So it's a co-production of software. And in my case, that uh, I, I feel like I want to move in that direction. I'm moving in obviously to open up the software in many ways, uh, but uh, it, it's a challenge to kind of find, you know, uh, like-minded people to kind of start kind of get these initiatives started. So that's from one perspective. From the other perspective, I think that the, the idea of participation, and I think that this was, um, has been already discussed by people, uh, scholars of the commons, uh, it's problematic because it suggests um, a, a certain relationship with what is being produced um, that it's already perhaps predetermined, right? And I think that um, the notion of commoning, uh, as we kind of get more familiar with the term commons, the idea of participants producing their own 
uh, form of value. Perhaps that would be called commoning as opposed to participation, right? And I, and I like the idea of, of transitioning to kind of a much stronger framework where we can position commons at the center. Um, but obviously, the commons is, is a word that uh, needs to be disentangled. Um, this needs to be kind of understood. Um, there's kind of different understandings of it. And I think that many people have been, you know, arguing for it. I think David Boyer uh, has been a leader in the space. And I think that really understanding the idea of commons, as I've been trying to do in the book as well, is essential to kind of move from a participation um, um, idea that architecture has been engaging for many years uh, to something that is a self-production or self-provisioning, as someone like Alastair Parvin would argue for. Um, so I think that self-provision as a kind of synonym or more perhaps another way of describing this act of commoning or producing for yourself and, and value that remains in the hands of the users uh, is not just participation, it's not just a form of kind of, hey, we want to give our take on what this project would be, it's how do we can create our own forms of value, right? Um, so in a way, the, the subtitle of the book, Participation in the Age of Platforms, suggests it shouldn't be participation anymore. We should actually go from participation to self-provision or from participation to commoning in a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, 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 the word participation is somehow staying a bit behind or short in terms of like we should be way more explicit towards what that participation might entail and actually, yeah, as you said, like a... a, a and that also applies... To our yeah, that also applies to supply chains. I mean, in supply chains, we seem to talk about fair trade. Uh, we seem to talk about, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, networks that want to be yeah, fair and equitable to the different members of the supply chain. Uh, but that, that suggests uh, the idea of shared value, as, as Michael Porter and the economist Michael Porter would talk about it, would suggest that we, we want to be fair along the supply chain. So that maintaining a healthier supply chain that would uh, kind of benefit, you know, um, uh, production in general. That suggests that that participation or that kind of form of uh, equitable production maintains a structure, right? I think that self-provision could, uh, in a way, alter that supply chain in many ways, and in a way in which, you know, people could kind of really own their own production and, and alter the way in which we consider the supply chain as, a, as, a, as an entirety, right? Um, that's not going to happen if that supply chain is, again, vertically integrated, owned by a company uh, or a corporation that has amassed a large amount of capital. Um, so the form of distributed forms of, of practice uh, and economies of distribution need to be central, in this case, to architecture. For me, they equate to, to kind of reinforcing the power of the social necessity of parts and, and participation really has a tectonic impact in, in architecture as well. Yeah. I think we have a question from the audience, so maybe we can, um, let's see. Someone is asking, um, the, participation, the part participation in participatory design means disintermediation. There must be at least one degree less of separation between someone and the decision, whatever decision that might be. Did the platform sell you exactly the same thing, the absence of a spokesperson? What you are saying, Jose, sounds like a zero degree of separation, you for yourself. Is that what you mean by self-provision? Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I think that you mentioned, uh, Denise, as well, like, or, or maybe it was Francesco uh, in, in regards to the conversation yesterday and the need for uh, individuality. And I think that that uh, could be understood correctly, but I don't think that we we want to talk about you for yourself. I think Boy David Boyer talks about the notion of DIT as opposed to DIY. Right? DIY means do it yourself. DIT is do it together, right? And I think that this distinction of creating a collective subject, right? What does it mean to kind of create a cooperative? What does it mean to kind of create uh, a collective? Um, it's something, or what, what I call it's a project of coordination, right? How do you create... Um, a conversation so that you, um, the self-provision is not just you, you create your own hamas in, like in the tiny house movement. You can kind of map the production of labor to your own individual home. And I, I think that that might not be able to scale really, but it, it might be more interesting to think 
that that attitude could also be applied to collectives when collectives are able to kind of create communities and either physical or online communities. And this is where kind of video games for, for platforms really become important to kind of uh, create dialogue and communication for creating collective subjectivities in a way, which we seem to be very much in this idea of um, self-provision as a, I create my own home. And I think that that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. I think that collective action is certainly needed and needs to be developed as a skill that we, we how do we coordinate, right? Yeah, and I think that that touched really like a, uh, what to me is like a very strong point as in like, I feel it's not only sort of like making uh, community or, uh, but really questions around inclusivity, no? Inclusion and also accessibility. And we can talk about this in different levels. Like you, you started the presentation with this images of Black Lives Matter, of the situation in Chile. And I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, and exactly as we are speaking now, it's like uh, uh, elections in the US and all this uh, extreme political scenario in which we find ourselves in. So it's, uh, um, yeah, I feel it's, it's, we should really problematize even more platforms or, or problematize or make way even more specific of what kind of communities are we making? Are we, are we talking about that we engage with our rich neighborhoods and we are going to make a platform about it or it's going to be uh, enabled for a different kind of uh, bodies or even different kind of uh, subjects? And I think, yeah, you can also talk about this in terms of like the profession or who has access to architecture knowledge, like historically, right? And who are the, the subjects that are architects and who, who for economic reasons can, yeah, they haven't been able to access to this discipline also. I think that the idea, I mean, I don't think that it's in our power to kind of create a community um, in a way. Um, I think that that conversation is, is kind of quite critical as well. What is the position in regards to uh, communities? I think that we can, you know, belong to communities um, and we play a role as many other people would play in different roles as well, right? Uh, I do think that learning from, from the Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter Movement, uh, there's been an interesting um, series of lectures that I've been part of and conversations where, where in a way understanding that communities have different roles and not everybody plays the same role. So in my case, uh, creating or facilitating forms of coordination um, through kind of some digital platform and, and, and an approach and idea that this could happen through games could be complemented by all sorts of different approaches um, and really kind of instigating a conversation. And, and I think that, you know, there's an attempt to, to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that I, the idea of bringing back some of these ideas of social realism, I do think that we are kind of living through a time where there needs to be a kind of a profound reflection on the profession of, you know, certain forms of practice, as much as we might not, you know, see them in that way, they, they seem to kind of feel highly alienated from what, what are the real struggles that we're seeing. And of course, we can argue that, you know, in the, in the, in the voice of enabling diverse voices and everything should kind of um, go or, or be allowed in a way or celebrated. I think that there's also a, uh, a necessity to kind of turn our gaze towards a, a much more literal um, understanding of these problems, how, how, how we could have a much more immediate response in, 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 in some of those struggles, right? And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer how to do that. In a way, I just kind of try to think that in a way the, there's some steps in, in that direction. Um, but yeah, I, I find very inspired by the work of, as I mentioned, some of the social realists that that really kind of uh, rejected a forms of art that, you know, how do we go from a gallery to, to the street in a way? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a difficult challenge. No, I think, it, yeah, it's... Uh, Especially in academia, <laughs> it, no. Yeah, and it's not only one answer, right? It's uh, uh, everything contributes, I think, and it's a different kind of knowledges and different kind of like, yeah, accessibility to, to, to yeah different kinds of platforms and, 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 and the kind of collectivity that all this can enact. Um, I don't know if, I think there is no other questions from the audience. Um, I don't know, Fry, if there's something else you would like to, to add 
or yeah yeah i mean i i wanted to leave the conversation between the two of you uh, i think actually i have uh, a lot of interesting like it created a lot of uh, interesting connections uh, that i will try to uh, my my mic is strange but anyway um that i'm that i'm trying to formalize uh, now in just uh, reflections. I think a very interesting aspect also of what you were saying was uh, of using games actually in order to uh, kind of uh, we were saying stealth learning or something like uh, uh, a, a sneaky way of having people deal with uh, bigger questions of ecology and so on and so forth of their own impact on ecosystems um, an interesting aspect was, for instance, that you mentioning uh, uh, patterns uh, of uh, Alexander uh, Murray and, uh, and, and Murray Silverstein and uh, Sara Shigawa. It seems to be like a push uh, in the architectural profession lately uh, to restart thinking in terms of systems. Like uh, the... Um, the, the, the scale of the challenge is so widespread that uh, if you want to build a house, fine. If you want to build three houses, fine. But how the hell can you build a hundred houses? You need basically a system of organization. And there seems to be uh, like a different understanding, finally, I would say, in, in the last probably two generations of architects, uh, a different understanding of the scale of the challenge and of the need to systematize uh, some sort of a thought that frames, uh, that can frame basically individualities uh, sometimes in order to, uh, to, keep, to keep basically a grip, to have a grip on... Um, on, uh, on, 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 the, on the transformation. Uh, do you do you think actually what actually happened? <laughs> I'm curious because actually uh, uh, up to the 60s, 70s, plenty of people were dealing with systematic. Uh, I mean, from people that were uh, um, uh, directly inspired by cyberneticists of the 50s and 60s. Um, and curiously enough, they their ideas completely inapplicable to the urban landscape, they got applied to SimCity, for instance. I mean, Forrester's ideas, uh, when he tried them on Atlanta, um, Jay Forrester's ideas, he realized that actually, based on his simulations, he would have had to get rid of all the poor people. Um, but unfortunately, so they, they, they decided to actually scrap that model that got later implemented in what became basically SimCity, so a simulation that at the same time in the feedback loop of those times fed back into a lot of urban planners uh, and the way they started conceptualizing cities based so much on, on that. But anyway, I mean, by now, those are just thoughts that I'm... Uh, uh, feel free to... to, to, to jump back anytime. No, I, hear, anytime. I think that you're, you're absolutely right. I think that there's a, there a time in which, you know, cybernetics had an important influence. And in many ways, I've been accused by, by some people to, to kind of be a return to cybernetics in a way. I think that cybernetics had um, a, there was an understanding of complex systems in a much more kind of um, a series of effects and, and a series of consequences that perhaps would be very difficult to kind of uh, explained through kind of the dynamics of, of, a, of a literal input-output kind of feedback loop of cybernetics. Um, so in a way, architecture kind of also, you know, took it in, a, in an aesthetic way in many ways and, and kind of a over, like, or continue moving in, in, in a vector where, where that was kind of left behind. Um, I, I do feel like I'm working from within a, a tradition of architecture that engages technology. Um, and in many ways for me, the kind of the breaking point was actually really thinking, how do you write a software that uh, it's not just a software, like a parametric software that would be used by you, 
moving a slider here and there, kind of defining a fixed domain, uh, but really kind of bringing in um, inputs that are kind of incredibly uh, or impossible to predict, right? In this case, a human input, right? Uh, in the case of a crowd and a, uh, and in a case of a, a multitude. And opening up computation to, to starting to answer or not to answer, but really kind of frame itself to a much uh, more challenging set of questions that have to do with the unpredictability, with the feedback loops that could exist between the production of a platform and the users taking part of it, the product, the kind of a circular form of knowledge, um, really seeing themselves from within. The platform kind of needs to model itself in, the, in its use to, uh, by users, as opposed to thinking that we can actually simulate swarms in a computer, right? Which is, it was a model of complex systems that was trying to kind of achieve a simulated form of complexity, not understanding that that complexity needed that kind of open-endedness or kind of change adaptation uh, that can happen from, from an external source. And so opening computation to the social, for me, is something that it's still pretty, in a way, early. Um, video games seem to be able to do that uh, in an interesting way. I'm sure that there's many other ways of doing it. Um, but if you think about the kind of inputs that our computational architecture has received in the past, we've gone from like sensors where you have a very kind of parametric domain between activation, not activation, and perhaps a gradient in between, and then the multiplication. And I talk a lot about the book about this idea of the, the space of possibilities created by parametric design, which is in a way a fixed domain, right? Uh, it's a domain that is established and you're kind of moving within that domain while a, a different way of thinking, if you think of a Lego or kind of a structure that is open-ended, uh, when you start working in combinatorial design, the domain becomes open-ended and it really becomes much, it, you can actually break the, the design in form of kind, I suppose, in degree of what, what a, a parametric design is able to do, especially when you, that open-endedness allows um, a form of self-production that could take the system in a completely different direction. So you are not predefining the terms of success or, or execution, but rather kind of creating kind of an open-ended framework. And, and that comes with a lot of messiness. It comes with a lot of, like some people would kind of criticize the work of not really achieving kind of legible forms of order uh, in certain ways. Um, but I think that that's precisely the point. Uh, if it was always beautiful and always exact, it would suggest that there is kind of a, a much more reduced domain uh, of agency from that crowd, right, from the public. So uh, it's inevitable that if you're gonna open up the work to, to be you know, played with, uh, it's gonna be a messy process. And the question is, how do you, how do you are able to kind of capture and, and, and build upon forms of knowledge that are produced within so that there's a kind of a lateral communication of moments that seem to kind of resonate or patterns that seem to be, that work and how do those kind of forms of, uh, knowledge uh, perhaps get uh, shared more or kind of, uh, how do you separate the noise from what seems to have value, at least from the perspective of community, which is issues that things like Reddit have been, you know, the design of the platform like Reddit has been centrally kind of addressing how do you push up things that seem to have meaning for certain people and push down the kind of the like bots on as well, but in a way, there's always shortcomings to these implementations. Uh, it's a, it, for me, it's a kind of an important question of how do you separate, I mean, it's maybe not my role only, but also participate in the conversation with a community of how do you make certain forms of production have a more visibility perhaps, or kind of be able to uh, adopt it by, uh, by others in case they actually provide value to uh, to the multitude, right? So um, a whole series of interesting questions that open up the moment that you kind of start engaging with, in this case, participation in a digital uh, framework. And also, thank God, then it's a, uh, it's not the type these these kind of open endedness and uh, um, undecided uh, undecided result. It makes me basically. It's, uh, it's quite refreshing also in terms of uh, uh, what the end result of all the thought process of Alexander has been, which is basically some sort of strange thing that got compiled in those gigantic four books of the nature of order, his last publication, in which basically he's 
depicting a higher form of uh, thing that he actually directly calls God, like the order of things and something to, to try to achieve, which once again in the context of our of our day to day of 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 today seems i mean makes quite a lot of questions arise like who's god uh, what type what happens if uh, uh, let, let's say like and in, and for him is is quite a specific type of god in terms of order of things and it Which, seems to me that uh, at least there is a kind of a healthy situation nowadays where we we seem there seems to be enough a consensus, I would say, that there we want to celebrate different forms of value systems, right? Like that we're kind of creating a practice of architecture that has a, a lot more diverse voices. Uh, and in a way, that should also, especially when you start thinking of, you know, designing places for cooperation, um, that should also kind of, you know, continue happening there, where there should not be kind of a delineation of, of a value system that is imposed or that it's alien. Um, if you're th thinking of a tectonic system, that itself also could be seen as an imposition, as it was the case, I don't know, with Jean Prouvé, uh, uh, with Meson Tropical, or, or projects that seem to kind of try to bring the solution to a community and, and often kind of fail to do so. Um, so perhaps some of the ideas need to be really thought of how do we create kind of a conversation and, and a community that um, is able to kind of dictate and define its own kind of codes. Um, and that might happen in many different places in different ways. So the adaptation and, and alteration of the, of the means of production uh, by, by a local context is, is, is definitely an, an open challenge. And, and when we talk about a platform that has a global reach, it should also be thought that that has, you know, a conversation that I just recently had is about you are kind of portraying a Detroit-like scenario. Uh, why not think that, that that might not represent someone playing the game somewhere else, right? And and I, they're absolutely right. Like, absolutely, I'm not trying to suggest that that would, but there could be ways of kind of extrapolating uh, some ideas and perhaps kind of creating or expanding by communities in different places to expanding these, these experience to kind of portray uh, other local conditions, right? Um, so there's definitely not an interest to kind of follow the, the steps on Alexander in that regard of imposing what are the kind of objectively correct patterns for, for design in any way. Thank you so much, Jose, for uh, joining us today. I think it's, uh, I think the perspective of, of, of video games is such a like refreshing angle to, to, to join the conversation around commons and around basically to me, it's just designing democracy, right? In every possible medium, because I feel something that is just so urgent right now. And it's, uh, um, yeah, as you were saying before, like when you start talking about the possibilities of video games, like open, endless, and en endedness, or uh, uh, enacting different ways of participation, I think that literally the, the possibilities become, yeah, way more interesting and like, Thing. I don't know who was like a video game theorist that said like we were really like in the very beginning of, of sort of witnessing what video games are able to do so hopefully a lot of people will um, follow your lead way more and like yeah um, yeah so thank you so much I don't know if you have like a last uh, comment or no I appreciate uh, Denise and, and, and Francesco I think that I really hope to continue that conversation in, in many different ways. Um, if whoever's interested in kind of playing the games or kind of trying, like, as I mentioned, there's always kind of free access for educational uh, purpose. And I'm, I'm always happy to kind of engage in further conversations on on what it means to create these platforms. It needs to be kind of a collaborative effort. Um, so, so yeah, by all means, you know, reach yeah. out and we'll continue that. Hopefully we can continue that conversation with volume as well. Thank you. Guys Definitely. For I mean, the, the, the the playboy research is something very recent for us. And I think, yeah, we were really hoping that you were, yeah, it was just bad timing, but you would be just like a, yeah, a voice that we wanted to have in the issue. So it's uh, definitely, let's continue the conversation. And also thank you so much to the people in, in audience. And uh, um, hopefully you, you found some interesting insights around video games and commons and uh, feel free to reach um, either Jose or us for more insights about this. Um, thank
Thank you and Perfect. see you next time, I guess. Thank you. Bye. Bye.